Hi, my name is Antoine Scott, and I would like to welcome you to our first educational workshop featuring Seek and Return in Detroit's Eastern Market, exploring print design. After this workshop, we invite you to participate in your own exploration of print design using typeface provided by Signal Return. And finally, I would like to thank the Michigan State University Federal Credit Union and Science Sandbox for their generous support of our programs and exhibition, Future Present, Design in the Time of Urgency. So this is Signal Return. Uh, welcome to Signal Return. We're a letterpress print shop, and we focus specifically on printmaking here in relief um, in the craft of letterpress. So uh, as my friend Brad Vetter, another great letterpress printer said, letterpress in its basic form is letters pressed into paper with ink in between. Um, so there's a variety of ways that you can approach letterpress, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about some of those today. Um, and I can walk through some of those with you. Um, we're kind of a unique space in that we're set up as a nonprofit. We have also a retail store, which is part of the nonprofit. So the retail sales help feed into our nonprofit, which is somewhat of a unique model. Um, but on this side, um, this is our retail space, which has quite a lot of different artists represented here. Um, a lot of people ask how much of the work is printed here, and the answer to that is it's growing more and more all the time. Um, as more work is printed here, we try to have it come from our studio side into the retail side. But the short answer is um, what you see in our space is representative of a lot of different artists um, who work in letterpress. Um, we have a few screen printers represented, but we're trying more and more to focus on letterpress specifically since that's what we do here. So the work that we have over here um, shows some of the work that's been printed both in the space and from other artists um, who work in letterpress, which means they're oftentimes hand-setting type, they're mixing their own inks and choosing more unique paper stocks than you would get through just a regular inkjet printer. Um, so some of this work here, you can see uh, this is an example of some hand-carved work um, that's been printed here. This work here is more uh, handset type from our collection. Um, other kinds of carving, and there also is a way to translate digital art into plates and print from those. So that's a technique that we can talk about a little later too. Obviously the level of detail uh, can be vast in terms of you can have big bold shapes or you can have smaller detailed uh, type. So some, every printer likes to approach letterpress in a different way, depending on the level of interest. So there might be more of an emphasis on illustration. And then on the reverse side of that, sometimes there's an emphasis in hand setting type. So as you get to know artists working in letterpress, you can kind of see where they fall in that. And obviously there's uh, those that love to work the full spectrum. It just depends on the artist and what they're interested in. With all of these type manufacturers making different sizes and styles of type, the printing industry needed a way for all of these components to work together. And so all of the type, whether it was metal or wood, used a very specific measurement called type high, which is represented by this gauge here. So any block that we are going to print in the shop has to be at type high in order for our press to ink it up. So again, with all of these options at our disposal and needing a way to organize everything, the industry developed different ways of laying out the cases of type. This is known as a case right here. So when I look at this, I can see all these compartments and all of these small, uh, relatively small pieces inside of here. And this is where each individual letter lives. If you were going to hand set a project, um, you would come to the layout of the case and you would hand set from inside of here. Now what's kind of fun as you get to know about printing is that there's some common terminology that we use all the time that you might not have realized comes from printing. So when we say uppercase and lowercase, it's referring to a case like this one, but at some point, 
before this case layout became the norm, they used to organize the letters upper and lower, um, the uppercase being above and the lowercase being below. So that's kind of fun. So we're over here on the studio side of Signal Return, and this is where we do the majority of our workshops and production. So when people first take a glimpse of our shop, if you were to come in and see what options we have available for you to use, your first thought might be, wow, there's a lot of stuff in this room. At least that's what I first thought when I saw a print shop for the first time, a letterpress shop. But what you come to realize over time is that there's so much stuff in the room because it gives you options to use for your project. And I mentioned earlier how letterpress is basically letters pushed into paper, but there are other options for you to use as well, and we'll go over some of those. But when you realize that you have all these options, uh, you need a way for them all to work together in a system. And so we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. All of these drawers, or what look like drawers, in the shop are filled with type. And there's really two different categories of type, depending on what size you're using primarily. There's metal type and wood type. And when letterpress was the main form of printing, if you were setting something like a newspaper or another publication, um, that's when type foundries would design and develop different typefaces and type styles for publications and, and layout artists to use. And what tied all of these together is a very specific measurement that they would use in manufacturing. And that's the same way that we get everything to work together here. So I have a block and the specific kind or I guess umbrella branch, uh, umbrella category of printmaking that we're working with is called relief printmaking. So if you get more into printmaking, you'll learn that there's relief and intaglio is the other kind of main branch of printmaking. Relief printmaking deals with any raised surface that gets ink on it, receives the ink, and then you apply pressure onto that. So we have to have all of our blocks measured to the same height as all of the type in our shop. So I'm holding a, a block that's been carved out of linoleum and I'll talk a little bit more about linoleum in, a, in the future. I mentioned that they used to organize cases in uppercase and lowercase and I'm holding a map here that shows the layout of the style of case called California job case and this became probably about 90% of the cases that you'd find in a print shop as the main layout. So just like you would hop from keyboard to keyboard now on a computer and find the same keys in the same spot, this became largely for metal type setting the standard in the industry. So when you go to a lot of shops, this is the layout that you'll see. Over here we have the uppercase letters and then we have lowercase on this side with the punctuation scattered throughout. And oftentimes when you go to work on a project, you can pull those cases out and set them on a surface like I have here. Um, since casting all of this type in metal becomes quite expensive as the sizes get bigger, you're using more and more metal, the type manufacturers would switch to wood. And so I've pulled a type case out that has these wood letters in it. So you can see how that's one solid piece that's been made out of what usually is a hard maple. Um, they would use other kinds of wood as well. But oftentimes, as my friends at the Hamilton Wood Type Museum would tell you about, um, the maple that was in a colder climate would have a slower growth and the rings would be denser, make, making the wood uh, better to use for making resilient, strong wood type. So a hard maple was a common wood that people would use for printing. So you can see on this case layout that it's an open format, um, meaning that the letters are just in alphabetical order, so there's not a specific grid like we find in the metal type. 
So what I've pulled here is a finished lockup of type. Now if you work digitally, you might still use the term lockup to reference different uh, type design that you're working on in a Photoshop or Illustrator or InDesign application, for instance. Um, but if you're working in the shop, your lockups are eventually going to be going on press. So I pulled a postcard size print, and this is the biggest determining factor for what kind of type you're going to use is what is the scale of your project in the end going to be. And if you're doing something like a postcard, then metal type is a good way to go. You can see that this is a lot of different typefaces put together, and it's just one approach, which is a little more of a maximalist approach. You can see the different personalities of the type all working nicely together, and that's just one style of working. If you want to work larger, that's when wood type is going to be a better way to go. And you can see that this type, which is a bunch of different neighborhoods in Detroit, um, it just has a different feel. The type has a little bit less of individual character to it, but it all plays well together because it's so bold and in a similar scale. So scale is probably one of the most uh, important factors when deciding what kind of type to use. Now earlier I mentioned that everything was tied together with type high, which is this gauge here. So what's nice is that even though we're doing everything by hand, you still can design on the computer and then turn that file into a plate for printing. So I have here a printing die that you can order. Now this is a metal die. Um, and this one in particular is magnesium. The other common die format is in copper. Um, and this one is mounted on wood. But when you get this from the die manufacturer, um, it comes all ready to go at type high. So this will go right on our press and we could combine this with, let's say wood type or metal type, and you can start to mix and match things from there. That's the fun about unlocking type high is that you can start to learn other things that you can lock up on the press and combine with the type that you're gonna print. A common way that artists who are a little more image focused like to work is using linoleum. And when I say linoleum, a lot of people, well, their first comment is usually, I've used that before. Maybe in middle school or high school, you had an art class and you worked in linoleum. Um, that's how I was first introduced to it. But another you know, common thread is that linoleum is used for flooring. And this is essentially the same material, just it's not sealed in the same way. But linoleum is basically just cork dust, pine resin, and linseed oil uh, with a backing on it. So we glue this material onto this block of wood to mount it at type high. And now we can take this put it on press, ink this up, and then make a print from it. So this is the finished block from, the finished print from this block. And so you can carve the different colors. That's gonna be the common question there, is how do you get the different colors? And once you carve your line work block, you can use that as a roadmap for the other colors to go on your print. I pulled this as an example of how sensitive the press can actually get. If you dial in how much ink and pressure with the paper that you're using, you can see that even the, the saw marks from the mill on the back of wood type will reveal this really nice texture and that can be really fun to play with as well. Now, even though we do a lot of traditional things in our shop, we don't necessarily shun the computer as a means of making imagery. So this is where I have a printing plate and this one's old and um, kind of dried up but what this is is called photopolymer and this is a plate that you can have made from your digital designs. So if you're into illustrating on the computer you can upload your design and have a plate made like this. I'm peeling this back because this is peel and stick and you can stick this onto a metal base and you can print off of that plate. And this is how 
this poster was made. This was for a fundraiser that we did. And this was all designed in Illustrator using typefaces that mimicked some that we have in our collection traditionally, but this is all laid out on the computer. So it's a great way to mix both digital and traditional techniques. So now that we've talked about setting type by hand, as well as using printing dies and carving blocks to make imagery on the studio side, we need a way to take all those components and get them onto a printing press. And the two kinds of presses that we have that you might encounter in our shop mainly have to do with which scale you're going to use. So if you are working in a small format, you might use what's called a platen press, um, which is a small tabletop press in our shop. And like I said, for small projects, that might be a postcard, a business card, or something like a stationery. Um, if you're going to use a proofing press, that is going to be for poster work and larger applications like the wood type example that we said before. So I wanted to pull together some components of a product that's in the works. This was for a demo that we were gonna do in town. So this has this lion and it says, I found art in Detroit. You can see that there's a, all this line work on the outside. That's all hand set from our collection. So it's using these components called ornaments so just like metal type, you can piece these together to make designs. And then over here, you can see the type I put together to make the statement found in the print. Now, if you're wondering what the string is for, that's for storing these components so they don't fall apart when I'm taking them from place to place. But for the most part, these will get locked up in this frame right here which is called the chase. So you need a way for all these components to not move. And that's where these wooden pieces come into play. Now this is unusual because we're using a printing die that I had made from the type that I set. So this has our statement on it, but it's just put together on one block. But I took these wood pieces, which is called furniture. And if you notice this bar right here made of metal, this will actually expand outward and push. It will create tension for our block to not move. And I do that by using a key right here. So that's kind of squeaky, but you can see that that will expand outward when I turn it. That's called a coin. That's what that component is for. So there's different styles of coins at different sizes, and you can use those to tighten your project up. So now that I have this tight, you can see that I can lift this up and it will just with pressure stay in this chase. So it's nice for transporting right to our press to drop it in the platen. So this gets dropped right in here and there's a little tab that holds the chase in place. But you can see how small this setup is. It's kind of a nicely designed compact press and as I mentioned earlier, this, this would be a nice format for using in something like a grocery store, or if you have a home setup that you wanted to make postcards or business cards and things like that. So up here we have this disc. This is the inking disc, and this is where the ink rides. You might not be able to tell right now, but there is gray ink already on the press. And if you look down here, you can see the inking rollers. This is what actually makes contact with the die right here. This is known as a platen press because of this panel right here. This is known as the platen. This is actually what applies pressure onto the die itself. You can see that there's this waxy paper that's under tension right here. So this is nice for taking ink and being able to wipe it off um, if we do end up getting ink on here. But for our purposes, we should be fine just because I set it up ahead of time. If you look down here, these pins are called gauge pins, and that's actually where our paper sits to register our paper to hit the die where we want it to hit. Now I've done some work ahead of time and lined this up already, so it should be fairly easy on that front, but we're gonna give this a go. So if I pull this handle, you can see where the ink gets covered on the die. Now I just inked that up quite a bit, but if I pull this all the way down, our paper gets pushed onto the die and that's how you get your finished print.
So we'll print a few more just to show you how that process works. And that's the basics of a tabletop platen. The second kind of press for larger applications is called a proofing press. And we have a row of them on this side of the shop. And when you're working with these proofing presses, oftentimes Vandercook is the name that, that comes up because most of the presses in our shop are made by a company called Vandercook, which was based out of Chicago. This specific model that I'm at now is called a Universal One, and this press was made in 1966. So that gives you kind of the time frame that we're working in right now. So with the Vandercook proofing presses, these were designed to make, like the name suggests, proofs of articles for things like newspapers or other publications. So you would have someone typesetting at cases of type, like what we talked about before, they would bring the lockup over to a press like this, and then you would have a press operator that would print an edition of proofs, um, depending on the application for how many needed to be done. But these were not really designed for large runs. These were made for, like I said, proofing, so that usually only a limited quantity were running at a time. But when technology moved beyond this kind of press for actual production, um, that's when artists started to use them for applications like what we do for posters or woodcuts or other things like that. Um, accumulating type for their own collection and purposes. Um, it's still, they're built very sturdily and they still work great. So I've locked up a type specimen here of type, wood type from our collection and you can see that I've got all these wood pieces surrounding. Just like on the platen, we need these to stay in the same spot because we want everything nice and even for this roller right here to come along and ink up. So we have what's known as the form roller. These make contact with the type itself. And these are rubber rollers that actually are loaded with ink. And then we have this oscillating cylinder. When I flip on the press, there's a worm gear that makes this cylinder move back and forth, and that's what keeps the ink all nice and even on the press. So just like on the platen as well, I've got my coin, and I've tightened that with a key so that this will not move. So now I can establish my registration and all my alignment from this stationary position. So I'm gonna load in my paper and I've got a foot pedal below that when I push it down, you can see right here that there's these gripper heads that pop up. And this is the spot where you can actually load the paper in. And when I release that foot pedal, you'll see that it grabs onto the paper. And that's what's actually going to pull this paper through on, on the cylinder. So when I roll this forward, this cylinder here is going to ramp down and actually push down onto the paper. And that's how we get the pressure for the print. A common question is how do you get the alignment for what's here to land on your actual page? And that's where this registration guide comes in. I can loosen this and move this back and forth and adjust my alignment using this here. But I've already got it set, so we're just gonna roll with it. And let's see how we do. And that's how you run a proof. So when we were in the print shop, we talked about the manufacturing of type and how you can put type together in a lockup and then run it through the press. 
Let's shift to an exercise we can do at home to think about type in a slightly different way. Now, I've got the specimen sheets that we printed earlier, and when I talk about seeing type in a different way, normally we think of type in terms of spelling or communicating through words. But when we think of type through a different lens, we can see that type is simply shapes put together. And if we start to break down those shapes, we can use those elements to create other kinds of designs. And it also could potentially help us make interesting patterns or other shape-based designs in our other projects. So I've just got simple materials here. I've got a pad of tracing paper, a pencil, a Sharpie, and a pair of scissors. So my main goal with this exercise is to take this specimen sheet of type and start to break down the individual letters into playful shapes. So I don't want to get hung up on being perfectionistic with this exercise, but it's a fun way to start to play around with the shapes and create something else using them. So what I'm going to do is take a sheet of tracing paper and put it over these shapes. Now I'm going to really just push myself to try to see for a letter like this B, how can I see shapes inside of that using just a Sharpie to break this letter down? So when I look at this, I can see a shape that looks something like this. So that's just one part of the B, but that alone makes its own interesting shape. And at the end of this, what I want to do is have a lot of material to work with. So I'm going to use the power of repetition by tracing a bunch of these shapes. So again, don't get too hung up on making these perfect. We just want a lot of shapes to work with, but I'm already liking how these shapes are repeating. So that's a good place to start. Now, another fun way to look at these shapes of the type in a different way is to check out the negative space that make up the form. So normally when we're thinking of creating these letters, we think of all the areas that are in black. But if we look at the areas that are in white that make up the letter forms, we might be able to pull out some extra shapes there too. So I'm gonna look at this A and you can see that there's a triangle here and then a smaller shape there, and that might be kind of fun to pull out too. So I'm gonna just trace that real quick and that might become something. And I think that's something we can use. So earlier I created this sheet with a lot of shapes on it. And one way that I found useful to help see shapes that you might not normally see is to take the specimen sheet that you're working with and turn it in different directions. Um, this can help you just take a look at the type in a way that you're not familiar with. So if I turn this upside down, I might start to see other things happening in this sheet that might not normally be as a parent to me. So the goal in the end is you want a lot of forms to work with because this will make the final step a lot more fun. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this sheet and start to cut it apart so that I have pieces that I can work with for my final design. So I'm going to take my scissors and start to cut these apart.
So now that I've got all of my shapes cut out, what I have here is a lot of material to work with, which is great because I want material to be able to play around with. This is a lot like being in the print shop and having all those cases of type that I can work with to make my compositions. But in our case, we're trying to think about type in a different way. So I'm gonna start taking these shapes and simply using them to arrange in a pattern. Um, now you don't have to do a pattern, you could try to create some kind of illustration with these, which would be another exercise that you could do. Um, but for the sake of right now, what I'm gonna try is just a pattern. So I'm gonna start arranging these. Because these letters are cut out, I can experiment with turning them upside down like I have with these Ys, or maybe with these Js I can turn them this way. The cool thing about breaking down type like this is that the forms are already made for you, you're just thinking about them in a different way. And that often is the fun part of creativity, is taking something that already exists and transforming it into something else. As you're arranging the shapes, you might be wondering what the end game is in terms of what you could use this for in your design. And there's a variety of things you could do with shapes like this. You could, you could make a border maybe around the outside edge of a poster, or you could make a border that separates other fields of type using these shapes. The whole point is that it gives you kind of a fun system to work with. So you kind of have a built-in framework that gives you limitations. I mean, we only have these forms, so we have to figure out how to use them in a way that's gonna be useful to us. So other things you could do is make a pattern like what I'm doing, or you can make an illustration, something that might be recognizable out of the shapes. There's a lot you could do. So even though we've done this in the physical world with pieces of paper, you could also do this same exercise if you have digital tools like Photoshop or Illustrator. Um, you also could leave this exercise as is with just loose pieces of type shapes like what we've done here. But I think I'm gonna take this one step further by gluing them down and then creating a final um, drawn version of this pattern that I've made. So I've reset my original pattern and I created this design, which is more of a radial shape, which is kind of fun. Um, now I could glue this down, I could trace over it, maybe I could layer several designs together, maybe I could scan this in. There's a lot that I could do with this. It's just fun to play with the shapes and see what happens with it. So I don't do an exercise like this all the time, but I'm hoping that this provides a framework for you to think about type in a new way. And again, you can take the creations that you make here and leave them loose like this, or I could glue this down and either scan or I could redraw the shapes, maybe with more tracing paper and layer them. There's a lot that you can do with this. So, Hopefully you found this interesting. Hopefully it helped you think about type in a new way. And if you end up doing this exercise at home, make sure to tag us at Signal Return on Instagram. And we'd love to see what you make with an exercise like this.